Welcome to The Debrief, where we talk with the Washington Examiner's top journalists about the headlines they're covering this week and where the story's going next. I'm Sarah Westwood, and I'm here today with senior political mm -hmm. correspondent David Drucker. And David, Congress had a really busy this week this week, obviously returning from recess. They seem to have narrowly averted a government shutdown after some drama. What were some of the sticking points there, and what kind of deal did they arrive at? Well, look, I think we still have to see how this thing plays out. The, the problem with the shutdown is not anything that involves a majority of Democrats or Republicans. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Charles Schumer, the Majority Leader, and of course in the House, Republicans don't have enough votes to stop things in any event. They all wanted to uh, avoid a government shutdown, which, is to ha which would happen early this month if it were to happen. Um, but it looks like they were able to agree on levels of funding for Afghan refugees. They were able to agree on how long the short-term funding bill, we like to call it a continuing resolution, meaning it keeps government funding at current levels. It's going to run through February 18th. Republicans were really insistent upon a date like that. And so it looks like between those uh, agreements, they're going to be able to come together. What I would still look out for, though, is, is a group of conservatives in the Senate in particular, because that's where you need Republican votes to get this done. Uh, in the House, you can get zero Republican votes, you'll still get it done, that want to tell Democrats and the Biden administration, we're not giving you the votes for government funding to keep the government operating unless you drop your federal vaccine mandate. And Democrats and the administration are never going to go for that. And so it's possible you could have enough conservative Republicans in the Senate that, that hold things up long enough that there is at least a momentary government shutdown. Because the way the, count, the, way the clock works is that it's almost impossible to get this done uh, in time unless Republicans don't force Democrats to run the clock on all the different procedural hoops they have to go through. So we still could have a short government shutdown, but it doesn't look like we're going to have anything along the lines of what we saw uh, over the past couple of years when these things just extended for weeks and weeks because both sides couldn't come together on an agreement. Congressman Peter DeFazio this week became one of just the latest string of Democrats, more than a dozen now in the House, who are saying they're not going to seek re-election next year. What do you think all these retirements signal for Democratic prospects in the midterms? Well, number one, whenever you lose a lot of incumbents, it makes winning races harder. Incumbents have higher name ID, they have a relationship with voters, and they usually have plenty of campaign cash and a, an existing political infrastructure that makes it easier for them to win re-election year after year once they've gotten first th the first few cycles. What we're seeing with Democrats is an understanding that Republicans are likely to win the majority in the House next year, the Senate as well, and they're not interested in being around for the, for the minority and, and the powerlessness of that. Now, I would say there are members of Congress like Peter DeFazio, uh, chairman of the Transportation Committee, who maybe is looking at it this way. I'm 74 years old. I've been here for 20 years. It's just time for me to go anyway. And that's true. Uh, you've seen a number of, of Democrats that have made a calculation that after serving in Washington for a number of years, it's time to go. But I don't think we can discount, and we see this every time one party looks like they're in the doghouse, I don't think you can discount the fact that some of them are saying, yeah, not only have I been here a long time, but the next two years after the election would be a total waste of my time because we're going to lose, we're going to lose big, so I'm out of here now. And I think that's part of it. And I think what that tells you is Democrats think they're going to lose the majority. It's not just Republicans who think that. And finally, heading into the midterms, Democrats appear to be turning to a number of retread candidates in some of these high-profile races, including with Stacey Abrams jumping into the Georgia governor's race this week. What do you think the logic is after uh, the loss of a retread candidate, Terry McAuliffe in Virginia, for Democrats returning to these familiar, unsuccessful faces? <laughs> yeah, well, look, there are two ways to look at this. I think one of the reasons Terry McAuliffe lost is because he ran such an awful campaign. So while I tend to think politically you're better off with fresh candidates rather than retreads, uh, sometimes these things are a little bit more complicated. Terry McAuliffe could have won anyway, but he ran an awful campaign and he ended up running against a first-time candidate who ran a very good campaign. I think Stacey Abrams running for governor in Georgia is, a, is good news for Democrats 
because even though their prospects for winning in the 2022 midterm elections appear low, getting their top get in a major governor's race in a swing state can give them some optimism that maybe not all is lost. And she was honestly the best they're ever going to get in Georgia. And she's a very good candidate who has a chance to pull off an upset in Georgia, especially with all of the infighting the Republicans are going through down there. I think in Texas, the point about retreads is a much better one. Beto O'Rourke uh, narrowly lost to Ted Cruz in his race for Senate in 2018. It was a good showing. It would suggest maybe you should try another statewide race. But in between then and now, he ran for president and famously flamed out after being sort of the golden boy, if you would, um, in certain Democratic circles. And I think having lost twice and now running for governor, particularly in a very difficult year for Democrats, in a state that still leans Republican, even though it's become more competitive, um, is a problem uh, for Democrats if they are hoping to upset Greg Abbott, the Republican governor there. The only thing I would say is, Beto O'Rourke has a lot of fans around the country. He'll raise a lot of money. And so it's possible he can give Greg Abbott a better uh, run for his money than any other Democrat would under the circumstances. Well, David, thank you so much for being here today. You can get more reporting from David and the rest of the political team at WashingtonExaminer.com.